Hey guys, uh, we're here now in the, I guess the other half of the last video, um, really kind of continuing on with the idea of delivery and transport and all that kind of stuff. Um, but here specifically about circulation uh, with this adorable little guy. I don't, maybe I'm weird. I don't know. I think lungfish are adorable. He just, just saying hi, you know, hey, I'm here. Can I get around the bottom of the tank? Can I breathe some air later? I don't know. I, Quarantine's getting to me, I'm sorry. Um, but when we talk about circulation here, one of the important things that we're gonna kinda need to remember here um, is that the pattern and process and the, the idea of circulation that we're used to as, as mammals and thinking about how the world works as, as mammals and as vertebrates is really not how most animals do it. Um, we're gonna find that most animals on the planet don't actually even have blood vessels and for that reason don't have blood they have something else um, so uh, we're going to start with the normal stuff but just be prepared to kind of check your um, presuppositions at the door so to speak what everybody is going to have uh, though is a, a quote-unquote heart and i am putting that in scare quotes here um, because not every heart really looks the same. Um, oftentimes we have animals with multiple hearts. Um, but the idea remains essentially largely identical, and that is that we have to have some pressure generating structure that forces some fluid from point A to point B. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, if there's no pressure, there's no circulation, right? And that's the whole title of the chapter, right, is, is circulation. So um, there has to be something. Now, this is a, a human heart. This is probably the one you're most familiar with. You may have seen this in other classes, a bunch, whatever. Um, but in the animal kingdom, anyway, this is a pretty odd thing. In fact, most, most hearts won't look anything like this. Hearts themselves um, come in a couple of different varieties in a couple of different ways. One way we can think about how hearts differ is the actual means of generating the contraction, of generating the, the pressure wave. The hearts that we're familiar with, the ones that you and I and other vertebrates have, it's called a myo, that's an M, myogenic, the G heart. And the reason we call it myogenic is that the electrical signal that stimulates contraction comes from the heart muscle itself. Okay, hence the myo part of this. Uh, and it does so with uh, one or two or sometimes more um, groups of autorhythmic or pacemaker cells um, that spread a uh, contraction wave across the heart in a very specific and uh, uh, time sensitive manner. Again, that, that's myogenic. That's, that's what we think about as hearts. Um, but when we look at hearts across the animal kingdom, a lot of them are not myogenic. In fact, a lot of them are neurogenic. Okay, where the signal does not come from a pacemaker, right? It does not come from a group of autorhythmic cells within the heart. It actually comes directly from the nervous system. So this means, of course, that the heart has to be directly wired to the nervous system, that our central pattern generator has to reside somewhere within the nervous system, all of these sorts of things. With a myogenic heart, we still have connection to the nervous system. We still turn up and turn down and set base rhythm through the autonomic nervous system. But we don't have to have a signal. Our central pattern generator is intrinsic. It resides within the structure itself, not within the nerv nervous system. The neurogenic heart, the, ex the exact opposite. Another way that we can um, look at hearts and see how they differ <clears throat> has to do with the actual structure of the muscle itself. Um, 
we can describe the, the myocardium, the muscle part of the heart, um, as being compact. Okay, you say there's no uh, gaps in it, there's no cavities within it. Okay, or it can be spongy, where there are lots and lots of cavities and gaps within the muscle itself. And the big difference between these two types of, of myocardium, compact versus spongy, and then some um, varieties kind of mixing the two over there on the right, um, is how the heart muscle itself gets oxygen delivery. Okay, so with compact myocardium, because the blood never actually directly enters the muscle, it just passes through the heart one side straight to the other, we have to have a set of blood vessels that kind of flip around and return and deliver oxygen to these muscles. So we have a coronary circulation system, coronary arteries, coronary veins, um, delivering blood. So the blood passes through the heart, makes a U-turn, comes back, and it comes back this way. Um, with spongy myocardium, blood as it passes through the heart just kind of enters into these little pools right uh, ends up filling these little sinuses in here in the muscle itself and across uh, the the cell boundaries here we get oxygen delivery by, uh, by rather uh, by diffusion so a couple of things with this um, this doesn't require any extra plumbing right so it's useful on that but two things uh, we've got a bunch of holes in our muscle Right, so we're not particularly powerful, we're not particularly efficient, and that kind of sucks. Um, and the other thing is too here, we're heavily reliant on diffusion as our means of transport. So only the cells really right next to these little sinuses in here are actually gonna get oxygen. And the farther away from those sinuses we are, the less likely we are to actually get any of it. Um, so the rate of delivery is pretty poor. The ability of the heart to contract is pretty poor, but it's a very, very simple thing. So <clears throat> here is something that we expect to find in uh, mammals, in, in most tetrapods in general, right? Uh, things that have four legs live on land. This um, is really something that we see more um, with weird things like, um, Salmon, sharks, weird stuff like that. Um, some fish have this. Other fish, most bony fish, have this kind of mixed um, outer compact, so an outer layer that requires coronary circulation and an inner spongy layer. And then over here, uh, like we saw before, right, we talked kind of a little bit already how octopodes, you know, things like octopuses and stuff, have kind of already a weird thing going on with their blood hemocyanin, no venous reserve, all that kind of stuff. They also have weird hearts um, for a couple of different reasons, but one of the reasons they have weird hearts is because they have this kind of weird mixed structure uh, where blood flows through these little passageways um, back into the heart and back out of the heart. And it's, it's a whole weird little thing. For our salmon, so guys that have this kind of arrangement right here, uh, the amount of compact versus the amount of spongy myocardium that's present um, varies quite a bit within species. Um, and what the big difference here is really how much migration effort is required. How far are they born from the ocean? How far do they have to return uh, when spawning? And the farther they have to travel, right, the greater the effort required, we find that they have more of compact myocardium and less of the less efficient spongy myocardium, which really shouldn't surprise us. So let's look at um, some hearts, some circulation patterns here. Uh, we're gonna start with something really, really simple, like a fish. Uh, the way that a fish is circulation pattern is set up is that the heart sits right in the middle between the respiratory structures, the gills, and the rest of the body. 
So blood leaves the heart, deoxygenated, okay, and gets pumped out past the gills, where it gets reoxygenated. And from there, right, that blood passes up to the head and back to the body, right, where it delivers its oxygen and returns back to the heart deoxygenated. So kind of a basically a single loop is the way we can think about it, right? Heart, gills, body, heart, gills, body, heart, gills, body. So everything is very, very linear, right? You don't have to have multiple circuits and multiple pathways, everything's linear. So the pathway of blood to the heart is also going to be linear, okay? They have a four-chambered heart, but blood passes from one to the next, to the next, to the next. So where it's going to start, blood comes back from the body here and enters into this chamber here called the sinus venosus. From the sinus venosus, it passes into the atrium, Okay, sort of the collecting chamber. And from there to the muscular part of the heart, the ventricle. And you can see here, this is a typical bony fish heart um, with both compact, compact, and spongy myocardium. And then from the ventricle, it leaves first into this last and fourth chamber here, the bulbous arteriosus, before it passes up to the gills. When we start adding a lung into the mix, that's when things get a little complicated. Okay, so here in our lungfish, we have kind of a irritating scenario for us in terms of trying to map the circulation pattern because we have a lung, but we also have gills. So our heart is going to remain the same. Our heart is not going to change. Right, a fish heart is a fish heart is a fish heart. But what's going to change is what happens when we leave that heart. Okay, and Basically what happens is within this conus arteriosus, we have a little valve and that valve can spread blood one pathway or the other, okay? Depending on which pathway it takes, it might pass blood past a gill, right? And that gill might pass directly to the, the body circulation pattern or it might offload it to the lungs where it comes back to the heart and gets passed off to the body, okay? So really our big, di our big difference in where blood gets shunted here is are we using the lungs to oxygenate? In which case we, need, we don't need to pass it by the gill. That's actually gonna lose oxygen, right? And so blood coming back from the heart, back to the heart from the lungs gets passed out to the body. Or are we using the gills? in which case that blood has to pass by these gills and come back this way. So that's complicated, right? And I accept that that's complicated. So the way that we're gonna look at this is really trying again to make this as simple as we possibly can in terms of a circulatory pattern, right? So we go back to our fish, right? And I apologize because our head now, our head has been over here the whole time and our tail's been over here. For these plans, I don't know why they did this. For the plans, the head is over here and the tail is over there. Whatever. For our normal fish, right, we had this really simple single loop, right? Everything was in what we call series. So if you've, not that you've taken any electrical engineering, but if you've taken electrical engineering, um, this particular circuit is called a series because it goes bing to boom, to bang, to bing to boom, to bang, right? Everything happens in that very specific order. When we start having accessory respiratory structures, now we have two circuits that run in parallel to one another. So for our lung fish, right, using a lung, which is a little chunk off of the gut, so we say the gut, right, our two circuits in parallel depend on whether or not we're passing it to that structure or not. So we pump blood out of the heart, passes by, the gills or the aortic arches or what have you, right? And it might come back to the gut and be fully oxygenated and come back to the heart and come around, right? Or, right, we might pass it off to the tissues of the body and then come back, right? So we have these two loops, the lung to the body, the lung to the body. And the downside to this, right, it, it works, it's good. We have a, a means of oxygenating our blood. It's, Great, it's wonderful, right? But if you look at our little line here, right? You can see that all of the blood being passed out 
to the tissues of the body is only partially oxygenated, right? Coming back from the gut, it's fully oxygenated, right? So we get this kind of mixture of deoxygenated and oxygenated blood because we have only one pathway through the heart. Okay, so it's not, not super efficient, right? A little better, right, in terms of living in oxygen poor environments and stuff like that, but it's not perfect. When we start thinking about living on land and losing a, living on land and using a lung exclusively, now we end up really getting very complicated. And this is kind of the uh, most complicated way this happens with a, a four chambered heart. So something we see in mammals and birds um, with two completely separate pathways. Uh, one we'll call the pulmonary circulation, right? we we'll go to the lung, heart, lungs, and back, heart, lungs, and back. And one that we'll call the systemic circulation, heart, body, and back, heart, body, and back. But if we kind of untwist it and we pull the right and left sides of our hearts apart, we consider them to be separate pumps, we can come back to this kind of single linear pathway, right? Uh, this circuit, if you will, right? Where everything's in series. So left side of the heart to the body, to the right side of the heart, to the lungs, the left side of the heart, body, right, lungs, on and on and on, ad infinitum. Um, and the only way that this works for us, right, the only way we can, we can keep this, this going is if we have some means of, of separating blood pathways within the heart. We see with four chambers, mammals and birds, complete separation. In the next video, we're going to see that this complete separation is kind of a, a process that builds um, as we go from um, things like amphibians up closer to, uh, to mammals. But that's for the next.